Hola. Can you hear me? There you go. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, as you can tell, uh, it's very hard for me to be joining you at this moment. If we were in Atlanta, we would have closed. Uh, the schools, the house, the hospitals, everything. We will be like in Armageddon. Uh, so you're welcome, I'm here. I want to start with this slide because I want to start to put a face to all the information that we have been talking about during the last couple of days. Uh, I have two purposes of this slide. The first one is, I know my last name is Angulo. I know uh, you see that I was born in, actually I was born in Mexico, I'm the souvenir from Mexico. I uh, grew up in Colombia, my family is from Colombia. Uh, so you might consider that my experience is only with the Hispanic community. And that's not true, the 18 years I have been in the United States, I have worked with the Hispanic community, with the Anglo community, with the Korean, Indian, uh, Haitian, uh, African American, uh, other, other cultures, uh, Vietnamese cultures very, very strongly. So um, the views that I'm gonna bring to you are part of this diverse world that I experience every day in my work. The second reason why I have this slide is very practical. As you can tell, I have a beautiful southern accent. <laughs> uh, so I want to make sure your ears calibrate so you can follow my conversation throughout the entire day, or the, uh, the time that we're together. When I heard the news that Pope Francis was considering to opening uh, the invitation for the Senate to be about the young people, I was extremely excited. And in my prayer life, I started to discern what is this gonna mean to us? Especially when we have been waiting for so long for a document, for a new map to develop in youth ministry. And my beautiful, powerful, innocent prayer life went like this. Dear God, I know what you want to do, but I can solve this problem very easy. <laughs> All you need to do is work in marketing. Very simple. Pick a Sunday, preferably Easter or Christmas, uh, you know, and a special celebration, and do something magnificent so all the people will have a conversion of heart immediately, and we don't have to worry about this anymore. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, immediately, I, that's why I love talking to God in my prayer life. He went, oh, Catherine, you don't understand. You don't understand the value that I see in each one of you to have the privilege to pass the treasure of the faith to the next generation. That's why I want to do a Senate. That's why I want to do a Fifth Encuentro. That's why I want to do a National Encuentro. That's why I want to do a guiding in, in here at the University of Notre Dame. I want you and all of you working in the field to have that privilege to help us move forward and pass this uh, good news to the next generation. So with that in mind, uh, I was called uh, by St. Mary's Press last year to join them in the research that they were doing going, called Going, Going, Gone, the dynamics of, that, of disaffiliation in youth Catholics. This research just came, back, uh, came out in January. Uh, this is a research of a study of the nuns. And I know we have heard a lot about the nuns, but, and that's why I'm not gonna explain the entire research that is, or, or the process that we experience. I'm gonna highlight areas that we haven't talked about it yet. So we can see the difference between the research that we received from Christian Smith and the one that just came out this year. The information is still generally the same, the numbers are changing. And that's why I want us to have the urgency of why we are doing what we are doing. So I'm gonna ask you, in your experience right now, think about your community. Who do you know personally that is a nun in your family, in the place of work? <coughs> Bring that person right now to your mind. If you wish, say their names. One of the reasons I wanted to do this is because sometimes when we get a term, we have an emotional disconnection to it. 
But the reality is, I am certain you know someone that is a nun. Or you know someone that is in the parish right now that is this close to become a nun. I'm surprised as a diocese and director whenever I talk to you ministers or diaries that the number one request that they ask whenever we have a gathering is, can you help us see how we can bring our family members back to the church? And these are the people that are working in ministry. So this is a reality. This is human. Let's give them a face. Uh, so the te theological reflection that I'd like to uh, bring from this is, why is this issue important? Because the issue is real. Because these are lives that have been placed in front of us for God, um, that God is hoping that either us or the people around us can reach out and also bring them back to the church if possible. So how is the process? At Mary's Press, I contracted Cara to do the, the quantitative study uh, in the year 2015. Then in the next year, they asked them to go even deeper and have deeper inter interviews directly with um, these young people. And then in 2017, they asked a group of three of us to gather for an extensive period of time to analyze the qualitative and, the, and to create a critical assessment of the voices of these young people. Some of the statistics that I want to mention right now are very quick for us to see the urgency mentioned, that, that I mentioned before, and then I'm going to talk about the stories. Uh, one of uh, the parts that we're starting to see is that the last sacrament that the nuns received was the fir uh, First Communion. It was uh, 63%, and confirmation was 33%. Why is this important? As a youth minister, I don't know how many times I have heard the confirmation is the last sacrament, the sacrament of graduation for many of our young people. Well, guess what? You have already lost a third of the people that should be in it. And I just invite you to think back in your parishes, in the ministry that you do. How many first communions you have this year? And how many confirmations you have this year? That's when you see the difference. See how the urgency has changed? The age group has changed. We're losing them a lot younger than what we expected. When we ask them, aside for funerals and, and weddings, uh, how often do you go to church? So rarely never was 28%. A few times a year was 26%. Once uh, or twice a month, 12%. Almost every week, 17%. Every week, 13%. More than once a week, 4%. Our active Catholics are probably between the 26%, which is a few times a year, the once or twice a month, and the almost every week. That is only 17%. So that's a, that's a significant uh, number of our young people that are located in that area. Let's go to another one. At what age did you stop self-identifying yourself as a Catholic? This was the one that blew my mind when I started to read it. Uh, under the age of five, five percent, and you go like, what? <laughs> are you telling me people are leaving the church at five? Well, this is usually when the parents were used to be Catholic or they got divorced and they stopped going to the Catholic church or something happened. Whoever was the person that was taking them to their faith uh, stopped doing it. The same between five to nine, the ages of five to nine. But when they started to have reasons for it, it started at the age of 10 to 12, it was 24%, 13 to 17, 39%, 18 to 20, 11%, 21 to 25, 3%. So when we talk about young people, we can see that we're losing them way early than what we're expecting. That's significant. And many times, they were forced to stay for a little bit, especially like if they were between 13 or 17. But the moment that they have a way to get out, they got out immediately. The medium age of leaving the church is 13. 13. Now, I want you to go back to your parishes right now. What kind of program do you have at the age of 13 in your parishes? What kind of ministry is going on for them? When we ask them, would you say, uh, 
You stop being Catholic more because you wanted to leave that religion or most because you wanted to join another religion. 38% say neither. I just don't care about religion. We have this uh, conception, especially in the South, that if they are leaving the Catholic Church, it's because they are joining a Protestant church. No, not really. It was only 15% of them that did that. There are 26% that said leave Catholicism. And the sad part is there are 9% that they don't know what they are leaving, but they just left. And both, 12%. When I see numbers like these, uh, when I see explanations to, like this, it can get a little bit hard to swallow. So I'm not trying to just make you feel very, the blues with the snow and with this information, like the go and get depressed. You're welcome. You know, that's not the point. Let's just start to, to see what, they are, what is the treasure of their testimonies. I'm going to ask, I hope you can read this. Um, what do you think are the top three reasons responders gave uh, for this for disaffiliation uh, from the church? Select the top three. So here are the, all the reasons that they mentioned. And I'm going to ask you to find the person right next to you. And look through around and just give me the percentage. Which one you think is number one, which one you think is number two, and which one is, you think is number three? Go for it. I'm going to give you a few minutes. Seventeen to twenty-five. Correct. Right. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna use my youth ministry skills. Five, four, three, two. Hola. We'll see who won. They are actually in order right now. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. But in reality, I have experienced it. Uh, two years ago, I was asked to speak in one of the, in LA Congress. I have uh, like 700 teenagers in front of me. And I said, okay, so how many of you know Jesus? Yeah, everybody raised their hand. Of course, I'm in a Catholic event. And then how many of you are agnostic? 70% of them raised their hand. And of course, my first reaction was like, Okay, I did something wrong. What was the grammatical mistake I made? My question came out wrong. So I tried to ask many other ways to see what was going on. And the teenagers, for the first time in my experience of 18 years, told me, we know who Jesus is. He was a good guy. But we see Jesus as we see Martin Luther King, George Washington. And they start to mention whoever they thought it was important. Zero emotional connection. I'm starting to see this in, uh, in events like that, this disconnection. So when we have uh, this experience, something that also touched me tremendously is that almost all of them say at the end, thank you for asking. Did you miss us? Did you, not, did you notice I wasn't there? I wasn't expecting that. So that's why when we talk about the nuns, I want us to see them as treasure, not as something that we can just ignore or just define by just a simple word. They are the treasure for us. 
Edward said, I am glad that actually, uh, finally, uh, I'm glad to actually finally tell my story. I have never really sat down and told it to anyone. Thank you for listening. I think that was a great first step. So to be truthful to their voices, I want to share with you one of their voices. Uh, sometimes it's interesting we got into these amazing um, moments of uh, intellectual reflection of what's going on, and we forget to hear actually the voices of the people that we're talking about. So let me uh, show you one of uh, the videos that we have from the uh, young people. His name is Chris. I would never discourage anybody from following a religion if it gave them hope, you know, security and peace, you know, as long as their, their faith or their religion doesn't devote them to something misguided or, or hurtful to other people. I grew up in the Catholic Church. My family was very Catholic. We did regular confessions. We went to church every Sunday. Holy Days of Obligation, Vigil Masses. We took part in Stations of the Cross. I also went on a mission trip my senior year. I'm grateful to the church for its part in teaching me some of my best qualities. Patience, reverence, respect, humility, conscience, forgiveness, selflessness, a general sense of community and togetherness and morality, and for helping create and strengthen relationships with people who have been influential in my life. I attended church every Sunday through my second year of college uh, when I was about 20 years old. I think some people need religion to help them deal with or understand aspects of life that are confusing, troubling, and unexplained, but I don't feel that I need that. Some of the nicest people I know are quite religious, but I find myself doubting whether they truly believe what they're hearing and saying if they don't, these are things that are kind of kept under wraps. They're not talked about openly. And it, it starts to sound like blind faith, which I mistrust. Over the past few years in particular, I've taken more of a notice of science as the basis for our existence and humanity as the source of our, our love and success. I think the teachings that the church was supposed to have been founded upon have been put behind the pageantry of the church. Th there are times certainly when I've been at church that I feel like it's, it's a club. And because I have these doubts or, or these other ideas about, about life and faith that I'm not part of the club, but everybody else is. People feel judgment by other members and that scares them, makes them uncomfortable, and makes them feel isolated. The church should be pulling everyone close and showing them love, giving them a home and support through their toughest times and most complicated decisions and feelings, but also still understand that they can't make those decisions for them. That love from the church has to be unconditional, the embodiment of God's love. I'm going to leave this slide just for a second. Uh, in this website, you can actually find a lot more videos from the young people that interacted with us. And they are for free, so you can see them with no problem. Another way to do it is take a quick picture. <laughs> OK, I'm going to continue. I will put this at the end of my presentation in case somebody needs it. So going back to the research, after uh, listening to all the stories, as you can tell, this wasn't just a wild person saying, I'm not going to be Catholic anymore. He actually had a reflection, and this, that's something that we uh, learned throughout the process. They have thought about it. They didn't leave because of one action. They left be because two, three, four, kind of three and you're out kind of mentality. So they did have material to say why they were leaving. Um, these are people that were seeking something. They just didn't find it in our church. 
Another lesson that we learned is a lot of them left when some difficulty came their way. Uh, for example, in a very young age, there was one um, man, young man that said, when I was young, my grandmother got sick. And the entire family started to pray the rosary together. We were 50 of us praying the rosary constantly, and my grandma died. Where was God? Why God didn't hear my voice? And you might wonder, well, is, you know, my first reaction was like, well, was your, how old was your grandma? You know, if it's like certain age, you can't expect it. But I couldn't say that. Uh, neither, and thank goodness I didn't. Uh, but the point is, we have been so good at sending the message. And I'm pretty sure all of you know this song, Jesus loves me, yes, I know, for the Bible tells me so. Our things know it to perfection. We have never talked about the value of the cross. And the part of the program, a part of the process is that Jesus also invited us to carry our cross and follow him. And that's a big part that we are missing in the catechesis and the evangelization that we're offering our young people. That's why when they face difficulty, they go like, this God doesn't, either doesn't exist or doesn't want me because I didn't qualify to have my, my request uh, fulfilled. So when we analyze the three we, we were able to characterize uh, the three major trends of disaffiliation. The first one was the drifters. And these uh, young people, their religious beliefs and the way that they practice their faith, pretty much faith to the point that one moment in life, they just look around and they say, why should I call myself Catholic? It's not part of my everyday life. It's not, part of, it's not an important part of my life. Uh, the second part is the dissenters, and they exhibit a more active resistance to rejections of the church. So I will actually would like to read this one uh, as one of the examples. This is what I know. I believe in birth control. I had sex when I was uh, like 17. I am completely supportive of gay marriage and I'm being able to choose who you want to be with. That's why I left the church. Plain and simple. That was, that was the expert. Uh, had experience, and many of them have a very uh, clear parts where they say, I cannot agree with the church when the church says this. And the other part is the injured. And these are the part that either something tragic happened to them. Uh, for example, uh, we have a, a girl, a lady, that, a young woman, that said, my parents never went to church. They didn't believe, my, but my grandparents, every Sunday, they drove, I don't know how many miles, to pick me up, take me to church, and make sure I have that. Until I was 12, and I found out my grandfather was having an affair. So her only mentors of faith were not living the truth. So what is the big issue here? Do you want to touch the life of the young people? Be authentic. And I'm gonna give you a very easy, practical example. Don't you think it's very ironic that God asked me to serve the youth in the United States speaking my third language? You know how teenagers like to make fun of stuff. <laughs> Let's be realistic. Guess what? They have never made fun of me. And it's because they know I'm trying my hardest to share something that I'm very passionate about. It. Teenagers respect if they see that you're authentic. Teenagers don't want to see that, oh, I'm with Jesus, so everything is fine. They want to see that you're also struggling, that you're vulnerable, but that you put yourself out there. Um, what is the theological reflection that we have about these drifters? I'm going very fast through this, this uh, research, by the way. I'm just trying to highlight whatever hasn't been said yet. What is the grace that the disaffiliated are bestowing upon the church? Their stories serve us as a mirror, reflecting back to the church, their life, and their experiences. Let's learn from the lessons so we can have a better uh, future. So when we have this, now I'm going to become very practical. Uh, in the Archdiocese of Atlanta, I have around 9,000 teenagers going through the confirmation pro program. I know how hard it is for many parishes to really have great programs. I have programs that they have three full-time youth ministers for 80 teenagers, and I have a parish that has 600 teenagers in year one confirmation with one part-time DRE. That's the reality of our church in Atlanta. 
So something that I wanted to do is I wanted to create an environment where we could communicate with them without preaching at them, but just by letting them themselves be disciples of the faith. So I presented this idea, and I know you are thinking, Catherine, you missed the presentation last night about technology and all this great stuff. <laughs> Guess what was the first thing that we learned? We learned that when teenagers were getting the magazine to your house for free, they were surprised that there was something in the mail with their name on it. That's why they picked it up. Then they saw the pictures, and they realized it was somebody of one of their peers talking to them, not at them. And then when they started to go through, I learned teenagers no longer read right, left to right. They make the movement with their finger, like you use the cell phone. It was fascinating for me to do this. I opened the magazines, and I was standing in front of them, and they always started to follow <laughs> with their fingers, which was a, a very interesting learning experience. <laughs> so graphically, we tried to fulfill that. This has been going on for two years now. They go twice a, a semester, and has created a great way to communication. We have done surveys of how this is working. We have been able to contact people that read the magazine for, that received the magazine directly, the person that they pass the magazine to, and the person that that person passed it to, to all the way to three places. You know it's valuable if they took the time to say to a friend, hey, read this. We have been able to provide topics where parents and teens are able to communicate and talk about it. We are not talking about the perfect Jesus story. We're just talking about journeys of faith. So then they can relate to it and interact to it. So it has been of uh, great success. And I'm going to give my points of what we need to look at in this Senate uh, in a practical way uh, so we can take the learnings from one of the avenues that we came up with in this creative mentality that we have to be now to be able to pass the, the good news. But before that, we also need to realize what is the reality of our structure. The first thing of the Senate is that we're saying young people, and we're talking about between 16 and 29, right? In reality, that will imply high school and campus ministry if you go to a Catholic school. Campus ministry, young adults. At this point, I'm not going to quote anyone famous or theologian out there. I'm going to quote myself. Now, because I want to work on my ego, I'm just going to speak around my personal experience of what I see in the nation. As a church, the youth ministry programs are doing OK. At least we have options. We have materials from the publishers. We have different programs that have been successful out there. Campus ministry also is doing OK. Young adult ministry, there is no network. And in reality, there is not much going out there. What I'm going to talk about the successful programs that we have in youth ministry. There are many guidance that we have. So we have NCYC, Student Bill, Life Teen, um, the game, N Division, the um, uh, service projects, uh, mission trips, etc. At least there are multiple options out there that if you could go to, you are a very a, you are going to be benefited from. It works. Once it goes there, most likely it works for certain people. Then we need to cover the pastoral who need and other groups that don't feel that they can match in. But I'm going to cover that in, in my next slide. What is the problem of this? We also need to look at it critical. They are good programs, but they are expensive. They are good programs, but they are event related. What are we doing in between? Are we preparing the people? Is our goal of catechesis or evangelization to send everybody to the mountain to take them back? Or can we really see God everywhere that we are around? There are good things there, but we need to have that create a hat to be able to impact more people uh, around the nation. I'm going to be brave and bring a group, age group, that is not even, we are not even talking about. But when I look at this research and I see 13, I want us to analyze how we're doing with middle school. We're doing poorly in middle school. Try to find programs in, in middle school. I think right now we only have Holy Fire and um, maybe a few um, mission trips around, working specifically for middle schoolers. Because what? I have heard many of you in conversations, you hate middle schoolers. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> so 
I want you to see this face. This was the face of a teenager, a, a middle school teen, attending a Holy Fire event. Have you seen his face? When he saw so many Catholics his age, he was in awe. Do you want to see how the awe to God be, is, looks like? Here. How beautiful. That's what I love about middle school, but we are ignoring it. There's an area that we need to work on. So if you really look through the age group that we are considering, our failing parts are the middle school and the young adults. Places that need retouches, high school and campus ministry. So then I would like the church to challenge us to say, whoever is doing something good, multiply it. But multiply with a vision that whoever is here can look up and keep growing and maturing in their faith. Instead of dropping it from, you do this program and you will be okay, and then after that, sorry, there is nothing out there. That's when unhealthy ministry starts to happen. How many adults shouldn't be in a life teen mass just because they cannot find a community as a young adults out there? And, and you really welcome them and say, this is called door, and you can exit right now and go and move to another ministry. But they can't. They cannot find their place. We need to be able to find the resources that we already have and start to challenge each one of those successful programs and say, okay, start to thinking before and after and be cons consistent. When I talk to youth ministers, for example, in a very practical way, I notice that they make the mistake of repetition. So every year we're going to do a mission trip every summer, and that's our great event, and we fundraise for 10 months to be able to do that one event. I ask them, why you don't do a mission trip the first year, a trip to Stuenville the second year, a trip to um, NCYC or any in division or any other program like that, and a pilgrimage the last year. At least you know you are challenging your child, uh, the, your teens, to move and to really see the amazing menu that we have in the Catholic Church. Then you can identify yourself which one you like better, and you can repeat it if you want to. But just to have that idea of increase, not an idea of plateau, which we so see in ministry. Oops, there you go. Being realistic, I invite you to go back to your parishes or your dioceses. What is your percentage of middle school, full-time middle school youth ministers, full-time youth ministers, full-time campus ministers in, in high schools, full-time uh, campus ministers in your colleges, full-time young adults? That's when you can see also a problem. We are basing our education in volunteers, and either we address in very intentionally how to train our volunteers with good quality, or we address and invest in professional people that can help us create a structure for a more fruitful ministry. We cannot expect what we don't have. And just I'm gonna give you a simple, clear example. About a student with a bachelor's degree, and I received so many resumes for positions. I usually get easily 25 to 50 resumes for one position. And when I start to interview the candidates that have the same degree, they come to me and they're like, oh wait, the salary is gonna be 26,000 a year for a full-time position? I have a debt of $70,000 from college. I cannot do this. We have trained people that know what they're doing and we cannot keep them in the parishes. We need to work on that. And the other big problem that, or challenge that we have ahead is that the catechesis is viewed by parents as just religious education. You don't know how many times I have heard from parents, why you are punishing us? And I was like, what? <laughs> you say religious education as a punishment? What's going on? And they go like, how, who came with this crazy idea that middle school meets on Wednesday and high school meets on Saturday and the other group meets on Thursday? You are hijacking my kids. If you only see ministry in that 25 hours that you, no, in the hour and a half or 25 weeks that you have per year, we're not gonna go anywhere. Creating community needs to be a love for Evangelization is not just in a classroom. Just, I invite you to look at the schedule of a young person. And you might wonder, do you know how tired you are sometimes when you're sitting here in this conference? You love the material, but your body is telling you, please stand up. Yeah? 
what we are doing is we are telling the young people, stay in front of us, well, in the school, all day with a, just a 15 minute a period for lunch, which usually is at 10 in the morning, I don't know how to deal with that, and then come to the church for another hour and a half, sitting in the, in the chair with a book and let's talk about God. There is a lot of talent in this room. We can do a lot better than that. So it's time for us to challenge us in this sense. Now I'm gonna talk about more faces. This is Daniel, and I love his story. He, his story is in one of the magazines. He said, uh, my family is Catholic. We go to church every week. So, whoa, they are super Catholic. Uh, <laughs> and he has an older sister, and he's the, only, and the, he's the next kid. So there are only two. And then one day in seventh grade, he was standing, and he was looking around and he, uh, during mass. And he said, why can no go up to communion? And the parents were like, what? Yeah, I want to receive communion, but I can't. And the parents are like, why not? And they're like, you haven't taken me to first communion classes. Seventh grade. And the parents are like, no, yes, we did. You forgot. Like, no, I haven't. Remember, my sister got the dress, and we have the big celebration. She went to first communion. I didn't. And the parents look at each other, and they were like, oops, we forgot. <laughs> and they only have two children. If it was eight, I would understand. Two children. That's when he started to have that encounter with Christ. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try an exercise. Are you with me? Yes. OK. I'm going to do an exercise to understand what it's like to talk to families, information that we think is completely normal, uh, but for them it's Chinese. I'm going to use learning a second language. How many of you speak another language? Raise your hand. Excellent. More than two. Three, four, five, wow, excellent, okay. So, one of my reactions when I talk to people, they're like, oh yes, I'm also bilingual. I took two years of Spanish in high school. <laughs> and I go like, great, so I start like with my, hola, como estas, que me cuento? And they go like, oh no, wait. Me llamo, and they go, you know. <laughs> and you go like, okay, two years of, that, that works. So. What I'm going to say, I'm not talking about people, immigrant communities. I'm going to talk about faith in, this, in these examples I'm going to give you. But I need your imagination hat, so be with me on this one. When you learn a new language, the first reaction that happens is you are afraid. When you come to one person that said, I took my two years of high school, I'm going to go to Spain, and I go to, can I, can I, thank you. You are the owner of the restaurant of the food that I'm starving for. And I'm so excited. And I'm going to be like, I want fish. But she doesn't speak English. So she's going like, fish, fish, fish. And then, you know, and the, exactly. That's the reaction that you get. And then you go like, OK, let's see if I found a picture. Thank goodness for cell phones. So we found cell phone, and you write down fish, translate. Pescado. And then we smile because that's the reaction when finally the communication went through. Like, oh, great, yeah. And then you go and get the fish, and then you bring it to me, and I want to fry, and instead it came something else. But, you know, it's the first day in Spain, so you eat it. <laughs> that's what is happening to our people that are disconnected to their faith. They know they're looking for something. They don't have the language, the words to express what they are looking for. So they are struggling to communicate the feelings. They don't know, they feel embarrassed. When, for example, one parent was asking me why my child cannot receive the first confirmation. I was like, first reconciliation, first communion, or confirmation? No, the first confirmation. <laughs> we need to be very gentle. It's not a matter of ignorance, intellectual ignorance. It's a matter of disaffiliation to the information that you are giving them. But you know what is the best way to learn another language? When you start to look at the lips, you are able to find easier how they communicate. You don't need to scream at the other person. They are smart. They, they, they can hear. They cannot just understand you. That's a whole different issue. Usually, children are the best people to communicate with when you're learning a new language because 
Children have the empathy to teach you what is it that you are missing. And once you gain the words, there is this reward to say, I can finally communicate what I'm saying. And I'm going to be very humble at this point. I know I'm a very smart woman, but I also know, because I'm speaking on my third language, many times I sound like a third grader. And I have been treated as a third grader. And it's not a problem of knowledge. It's a problem that probably I forgot one word. Or probably I messed up in the grammar somewhere. And I have a degree in other languages. So be gentle in the way that you inform our church. And don't think that all of it is lack of knowledge. Sometimes they just don't know the language to be able to communicate. It's a completely different concept. So that's the encounter. Do you want to encounter with Christ? We have to do this. Another reality that from the psychological point of view, 46% of our young people in today's world have unhealthy relationships between their parents, their community, the people around them. Just picture how that will translate with a relationship with God. How they can learn what is a healthy, um, a, a healthy relationship. Follow me. The accompaniment. I want uh, to share this amazing story of Lucero. Lucero is a girl that was born in Mexico, and at eight months old, she was brought to the United States illegally. Bright, bright woman. The dream of her life is to be a teacher. She can't because she's illegal. But Lucero has an even a deeper issue. Her parents never gave her a birth certificate in Mexico. So she doesn't belong to any country. Many people go like, oh, are you talking about deportation? I wish she could be deported. There is no country that can, that can claim her. So she lives in the hiding in the United States somewhere. I'm not going to tell you. You could kill me. Uh, <laughs> dreaming big, a smart, empathetic. When I went to her high school, uh, she was able to get a high school degree. How? Well, don't ask. But she was able to get a high school degree, and every single person that saw me spoke so highly of her, from her peers, the teachers, the maintenance people. It was just incredible. When I started the journey of accompanying with her, her question to God was, why, if I haven't done anything wrong, the decisions were made for me, God is not giving me any chance to live a decent life. Why do I have to live in hiding? So whenever she goes to any kind of church event, she doesn't hear a message for her of hope. We need to start to send a clear message for all of those that are in the margins. Because this is the only place that they can receive the message of hope for their life. The beautiful part of this journey is at the end she said, and the, I'm talking at the end, meaning months of me got meeting with her before we did the, the article, she said, you know what, Catherine, I learned one thing. If you really look at my life, I didn't have any, any chance to succeed, any chance to get any kind of education. And so far, I can count that I got a high school education and a passion for teaching. So God was taking care of me in the midst of the hardships that I experienced. Accompaniment. Remaining me, uh, another beautiful girl, Doris, from the country of Togo. Uh, she left her country in Africa due to violence. And you could never guess the most tragic experiences that she had as a child when you see that smile, which you can never take out of her face. It's incredible. Uh, and her sense of love for community is amazing. But in reality, I don't know if you have noticed, but I'm showing you saints coming up in the church. You didn't meet Mother Teresa? I can introduce you, Doris. She's on her way. The love for community is incredible. And her way that she gives herself, and she doesn't notice. She kept saying, like, I don't know if I'm doing something extraordinary. I'm just helping the people from Syria, because I understand what it is to send to another country that you don't know, to not be welcome, and to have all these cultural difficulties. I just want to provide them with whatever I have. She only has three pieces of clothes. When we did a photo shoot, we were like, bring your clothes and see what we, uh, so we can take you to different places. Only three. Now, you might wonder, Catherine, you are only talking about the immigrants. Church, our teens live in a world of violence. All of them. 
Anglo, Hispanic, Haitian. I grew up in Colombia during Pablo Escobar, and I'm pretty sure you have seen a lot of movies about that that are completely grown, but you get the point. It was violence. And as a child, I remember bombs exploding in the city randomly, just because the man wanted to make a point. That was bad for me, whatever she experienced, but I never experienced it personally. I saw the city being bombed when we have to hide and we taught in the school how to hide and all this stuff. When uh, what she experienced in, in Togo was even worse. She saw that near her. But our teens right now, they kill each other through bullying. I know that shooting in Florida is very touching, but if we collected all the teens that have killed themselves because of bullying, we would be overwhelmed with the number. We need to send a clear message from the church to our young church that is hurting, is traumatized, that God is there for them and he loves them. Community. The other part of community that we need to be aware of is whatever uh, ways of ministry that we develop in the, in the upcoming years, we need to have four walls of, of foundation. The first one is protection and exploration. Exploration because we need to allow our teens to, to explore the world. To deny that there are other religions around, that our teens don't have friends that are uh, in the outskirts of our beliefs, or that they are following yoga or uh, any other kind of thing that you want to think of. My first, best friend from college was Buddhist, or is Buddhist, uh, and we are great friends. Actually, she's the one that told me not to lie. So that's <laughs> one. But then we have the protection, the protection of giving them an environment where they at least know who they are in that exploration that they are experiencing. Right now they get overwhelmed with any kind of information that comes their way is because they don't know who they are. They don't know their identity. And the other two pillars that we need to keep looking at is between the, the empathy and the truth. When we are, we are doing ministry, look at the words of what our disaffiliated said. We need to be empathetic of the realities. The worst mistake that you can do is to see a teenager at the eyes Come into a sacrament and say, oh, by the way, your parents are on the third marriage. Get out. That's the reality. So you start the ministry with the empathy. And in that dialogue, you start to bring the truth. And the truth comes through mercy. And that's how you balance your dialogue of, um, of uh, evangelization to the young church. That's when you are going to be able to connect with them and to move forward with them. And then I'm going to move into vocation. This is Ashley. Ashley is a girl from the Vietnamese movement, Catholic movement, Eucharistic movement. And she had the most amazing process of faith, uh, going from, I have a call, and my call is to be a pilot in the Navy. And I'm Vietnamese from a very traditional Vietnamese community. How am I going to do this? So she started praying very strongly. And she felt that that call was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So she had the guts to go and tell the parents, and here is her family, me, your younger child, wants to be in the Navy. The parents, of course, Vietnamese, coming for what you, if you look at history, all the people that died in Vietnam is related to their families, was that immediately, no, and why you are doing this? And she said, this country has helped me, and I want to help this country. It took a lot of dialogue with the family, but she finally was able to find her vocation. Whenever we're looking at vocations, and I know you're going like, Catherine, you missed the point, vocation is to religious life or, no, no I, I'm with you. But we also need to improve, to, to, to explore with all of our young people, what is their vocation? Because the moment that she was going to that discernment and she started to talk to her peers, they started to express what kind of vocation and discernment they were going through. So now discernment for a whole, a purpose in life, became important to all of them. It became accepted instead of saying, I have a vocation for priesthood. And everybody jumps, boom, you know? You want healthy ministry? That's the best way to do it. This is the picture of Archbishop Gregory uh, when he was a teenager. We covered these pictures of him when he was young in one of the magazines. Uh, the most impressive part was that in all his pictures as a teenager, he was the only African-American person in all the pictures. You don't know how many teenagers wrote to me afterwards saying, he understands me. 
he became human. Now I respect him. This is our, uh, he was our auxiliary bishop, Bishop Sarama, now he's the new bishop in Raleigh. When the kids saw him, they said, he has the best fashion in the world. <laughs> he's wearing exactly the same clothes and glasses that I'm wearing right now. In the next confirmation guidance, it was like he was a superstar. <laughs> the teens felt comfortable because they saw him human. And then when Bishop Ned uh, came to the diocese and shared that he was a pilot, the kids thought he was the coolest human being. Ashley was inspired to talk to her family when she saw that picture. Why do I share this? You went through vocation? then present yourself to the youth as a whole person with a past and with a future because things will respect. Do you want to see an awkward conversation? Go to any confirmation right, after, uh, right when the bishop comes and the things are shaking because they know they're gonna get questions <laughs> and they don't know who this man is but they know they have to respect him. After we started to talk about little details of them the dialogue comes immediate because they were able to have tips to start a conversation with them. They became human. So when you have a natural dialogue, then you can talk about anything. But when it's somebody that you don't feel familiar with, you get to stop often. And finally, we are called to go and may, therefore make disciples of all nations. Uh, this is a, a Edward, and he is another extraordinary young man, football player, uh, that he decided to get out of football player because he was starting to have a behavior outside of his faith, and he decided instead to become a leader in his parish because he knew the level of violence that was going on around his, diet, his parish, and that he wanted to be a true hero, not the hero of the, of the football team. The school doesn't like him yet uh, because he was a very important player, but what a great testimony for his church. I hope this evaluation doesn't look just hopeless. Here are my goals for the church. If we connect, I know talking about the different cultures that we have right now in our young people is difficult. But if we're able to connect the passion that Hispanic community has for the sacraments and the discipline that the, His, the, the Anglo community has for the formation in between sacraments, and we put those two together, just picture the kind of church that we can have. And if in addition to that, we add the commitment that the Vietnamese community and the African community has to the commu community itself, and we put that together, just picture the potential of church that we can have, especially in a new generation where they don't see cultures, they don't see races, they just see each other. I hope this talk was inspiringly, inspiring for you. I know sometimes it's hard, but I hope this is going to give you a a good way of thought to embrace the sin that we are uh, ready to embrace. Thank you so much.